does an entertainer do when a pandemic strikes and she can no longer perform on stage in front of live audiences? Today, we're talking with performance artist Christina Wong about how the pandemic has affected her work and how the great work she is doing affects us all. You may have seen Christina on Comedy Central, CNN, or in the art section of the New York Times. This LA-based performance artist work transcends genre and dimension, leaping from the stage to embrace the now. It is immediate, it is fluid, and it is hilarious. Recently, Christina began using her talents to serve those in need during these trying times. I am so excited that you're with us here. Christina, welcome. Hello. And thank you for joining us. <laughs> I'm glad I woke up. Yes. I'm glad you woke up too. <laughs> Here we are. Day 300 something of the pandemic. Yes. How are I'm you? I'm okay. I'm glad you're catching up with some sleep. I wanted to start with your work. Sure. Describe for us what you do. Okay. Yeah. So before the pandemic, I toured one person shows around the country, which I wrote and performed in myself and very little time spent at home. And I was able to make a living this way. And then when I'm at home in LA, I pick up film projects here and there, or I've been an artist in residence in the city of LA. So I had a national tour set up and all that fell at the wayside, <laughs> middle of March, as, it, as, as all our plans did. How else has the pandemic affected your life? Um, oh, so much. Basically now my work is all online. In weird ways, I'm I'm more quote unquote productive, which was something I had feared I wouldn't be at the top of the pandemic. And now I'm like, oh, shut that idea out of the water. You know, there's, there's an undercurrent of misery <laughs> to, to like having to live like this. At the very top of the pandemic, I was just like having this like, oh my God, I'm a non-essential worker. I'm a non-essential worker. And, and also it was like very hard to complain because here are people putting their lives at risk. Here are nurses going to work with no PPE. At the top of the pandemic, I actually was reluctant to wear a mask because my Asian face is already a mask that I wear every day, which would cue people, hey, oh, you you angry at the situation? Go take it out on this Asian woman on the street wearing the mask who looks like the virus, right? So I, I was like, oh, I know how to sew. I can sew masks. There, these hospitals are asking for masks. And I very naively offered up to Facebook, if you're immunocompromised, let me sew you a mask and you just, just reimburse me for shipping. And if you don't have the shipping money, don't worry about it. This blew up. This blew up in a matter of days. And I had hundreds of requests for masks and not the capacity to sew them all. Four days into this ridiculous offer to sew people masks, I started a Facebook group because I was like, I need to find other people to like help me with these requests. And people were just giving, sending me all this money. How did you come up with a name for the group? So in Asian communities and a lot of communities, auntie is not necessarily a blood relative, like an older, like kind of lovable woman who does caretaking. So I called it the auntie sewing squad. So it, it sort of was an informal thing that now has become more formalized as we've gone along. So now we have a whole group of super aunties. Then we realized farm workers and indigenous folks need the masks. And we were like, and it became really clear like there's a lot of people who can find me because they have access to the internet, to the English language, to water, to electricity. <laughs> but there are all these communities in America, uh, some at the border who we give stuff to, who can't find us, can't wave us down. And so we set up super aunties to specifically reach out to those communities. And we had cutting aunties, we had sewing aunties, we had we have care aunties. Wonderful. How many masks have you sent out? Uh, over a quarter million. Probably 260 or 270. Now there are aunties who can do 100 a, a, a week. But like, I mean, the first aunties were like making like, they made like five and they're like, I made five masks. Because <laughs> it was just like, we just didn't know what we were doing. And how do you get together? Zoom. We have Zoom meetings. Uh, we have what's called a stitch and bitch where we just sort of meet and talk and we just sort of sew. There's a book club in June when we were in the middle of our, or at least a, a pronouncement of the racial reckoning that I think we've been in this whole time. It became clear that, wow, all the communities left that we're sewing for are communities that have borne the brunt of systemic racism, of, of structural violence. Um, that's what they have in common. So the fact that we are sewing for these communities that the federal government has long since forgotten 
is is our political activism. And it is a beautiful form of activism, Christina. Now, where do you go from here? I think that our community it will be very powerful. I think about groups like the Black Panthers or the Brown Berets or like these groups that maybe are not active now, but have this like power and cultural memory for what they did do at the time, like your feed school children or whatever. And I, I, I hope Auntie Sewing Squad, I hope our work is remembered when we look back at this time that we, that we know that women of color stepped up, that we weren't just people being hate crimed over and over again during the pandemic, but that we have done the work of allyship and do stand in solidarity with a lot of these communities. Like my mother and her friends, like you'll never see them at a rally. However, they were sewing for people in prisons. They were sewing for, for, for people at BLM marches and stuff. And I'd like to me, if that's the closest I can get my mother to where my politics are and to the things I care about, awesome. Like, I'm so proud of her now. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And I look forward to our book launch. We're supposed to have a book out in the fall uh, from UC Press. And um, I look forward to us being able to meet in person as aunties, hug each other, recount stories from, from our time sewing for this group. I mean, it's a really kind of beautiful intersectional, intergenerational project. It really is. Well, thank you so much, Christina, for the work you do and for taking this time to talk with me. Thanks for seeing value in it. Thanks yeah, for seeing value in yeah. It. Is there anything you want to add? We can follow us at AuntieSewingSquad.com. That's AuntieSewingSquad.com. Thank you so much. All right, Renita. Good to see Good you. Good to see you.